from San Francisco. We have Robert Horrocks, who is the chief investment officer at Matthews Asia, where he approximately manages about $15 billion in assets. Gonghei Fa Choi to your Gong Si Fa Tsai. Robert, good to have you back on the program. Uh, first, let's uh, talk about what happened on the U.S. side. Uh, were you surprised at all by what Ben Bernanke had to say in the Fed, really extending their ultra-low interest rates policy? No, the, the Feds are likely to keep the uh, interest rate low for a long period of time. You know, the, the U.S. government can borrow in real terms uh, um, money at a negative interest rate. The, the interest rate on 10-year tips, that's inflation-protected securities, is about minus 10 basis points, which seems to reflect a pretty pessimistic outlook for investment opportunities. Yeah, well, Robert, uh, you know, I, I guess a lot of investors are really eyeing in on what he said about QE3. He, he didn't take it off the table. He said it's still an option, right? He doesn't know when he's going to actually use it, but uh, people are thinking that's sounding pretty dovish, and we have QE3 and quantitative easing. That's good for stocks. Uh, what does that mean for your portfolio? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, it does sound um, fairly, uh, fairly dovish. Uh, I, I, the point about uh, tips yields is that there is such pessimism around the world at the moment. If it's not worrying about slow growth and unemployment in the U.S., it's worrying about sovereign defaults in Europe. And when you look at the valuations in Asia, we're now down at levels where the Asian markets don't spend a lot of time at these low valuations. Uh, with forecasts for, for growth in Asia far from, from overly bullish. So you put all that together, plus um, more sensible monetary policy in Europe is already happening, the potential of looser monetary policy in the U.S., and you're seeing countries like India and, and China already loosening uh, at the margins. Um, it it it's all seems like a dangerous time to be too pessimistic. Mm. So what's the strategy in the markets then, Robert? Well, the strategy is actually first and foremost not to get too sucked in uh, into what is happening now, and that is not too sucked into the uh, to the to the events in the in the capital markets on a day-to-day -day basis, but to step back and think about what has Asia achieved over the last 10 years in terms of growth of per capita incomes, what has uh, Asia, uh, how has Asia done this, which is really by reforming its political systems. And this will be a year of elections again for Asia by reforming its market institutions and by giving individuals the opportunity to improve their skill sets and to make a better life for themselves. And with the view that they are still able to do this going forwards and you're now getting the Asian markets at pretty attractive valuations. So that's the strategy and it's looking at those, those businesses that will, will do well in that environment. Yeah, which businesses, where are they? Which ones are, are you holding? Well, uh, you know, I think uh, the, the, one of the, the great pieces of news out of China in, in the last uh, 12 months has been the increase in incomes, uh, wages rising at a, a real rate of the high teens, uh, and also income inequality within China actually decreasing, and that means uh, um, more consumption from second and third uh, tier cities. So looking at consumer facing businesses, retail businesses, healthcare, insurance. Um, in some of the other countries, and it will differ across the region, in India you'll have a lack of infrastructure, a country that badly needs to build up its infrastructure over the long term. Interesting uh, opportunities there in terms of industrial businesses. Um, elsewhere underdeveloped banking systems, uh, particularly in ASEAN, and, and again, opportunities here in what are relatively under-geared, under-leveraged economies to, mm -hmm. to participate in that growth and that development over time. Yeah, but is there any concern, Robert, of slowing growth? Because we just got uh, GDP numbers from South Korea coming slightly below estimates, and then you get a factor in, of course, the Chinese GDP numbers, which weren't that bad. It's still the slowest growth that we've seen in two years. Well, Korea is a very open economy, and therefore it will be the GDP numbers will be more influenced by what's happening in short term in growth in, in Europe and, and the U.S. Than, than other economies in the region. But you look at economies like, for example, China with 1.2 billion people, India with close to a billion people, Indonesia with, what, 250 million people. These are actually predominantly domestically driven economies. Um, mm -hmm. And so I don't expect the, the five, ten-year picture for these economies to be that 
much impacted by what you're seeing in the US and Europe at the moment. Now the markets will react and will swing from one extreme to another in a short period of time. But we're not really trying to play the guessing game of what sentiment is like. We're trying to take a, a cold, hard look at what the growth prospects are for businesses and see if we're getting okay. decent valuations. And I have to say right now we are. All right. Robert, uh, thank you for your time.